risk management cuts across all aspects of an outdoor recreation activity. This module focuses on applying barrier analysis to the decision-making process of an outdoor leader. Originating in the 1970s, barrier analysis is rooted in considerable research and is the basis of risk management for large agencies including the Army Corps of Engineers, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, the Atomic Energy Commission, and NASA. It was applied to outdoor recreation by this author. Conceptually, barrier analysis is easy to understand. All incidents and accidents involve an unwanted energy transfer from a source to the target. Typically, you seek to place barriers between the source of the potential unwanted energy transfer and the target. Unfortunately, the barriers are less than adequate. They are not perfect. Quite simply, your strategy is to play the what-if game, where you look for potential unwanted sources of energy flows that could transfer to and harm the target. You have an outdoor kitchen. The cook is boiling water on a gas stove for dinner. The stove is a source of a wanted energy transfer, which results in boiling the water. Playing the what-if game, you ask what if the boiling water spills and burns the cook. This wanted energy transfer can quickly become an unwanted energy flow and transfer to the target, the cook. Injury, damage, or loss from the boiling water can result. The question is, what can you do as the leader to reduce the likelihood of an unwanted energy transfer, which can cause injury, damage, or loss? You can place barriers on the energy source, between the source and target, on the target, and separate by time and space. In essence, the following alternatives become barriers. In addition, we'll divide barriers into hard or physical barriers and soft barriers, which include policies, procedures, and practices. Not using stoves and eating cold meals is a soft barrier that eliminates the stove as a potential unwanted energy source. Wearing shoes and long pants while cooking in the kitchen would be considered hard barriers placed between the boiling water and the skin. Requiring cooks to wear them is an example of a soft barrier. Giving cooks a safety talk on stove use is an example of a soft barrier on the target. Prohibiting non-cooks in the kitchen is a soft barrier that separates other potential targets from the potential unwanted energy source by space. Conducting another activity while the cooks are cooking is a soft barrier that separates other potential targets from the potential unwanted energy source by both time and space. Each of the barrier alternatives is less than adequate. Boiling water can work its way through wet pants, safety talks can be ignored, and prohibiting non-cooks in the kitchen can also be ignored. Let's apply barrier analysis to some scenarios. It is the evening of the first day of a multi-day backcountry trip. The youth group wants to go swimming after a long day of paddling. Not opposed to going swimming, the leader has a group discussion and mentally plays the what-if game. He throws out several alternatives for discussion. Which of the following alternatives would you support or guide the discussion toward? The group discusses several alternatives. They quickly dismiss the no swimming option. They want to cool off after a long day of paddling. There were no obvious hazards and they could easily define the limits of the swimming area. The leader notes in different circumstances, no swimming might be the best option. Life jackets work, they keep you afloat. The leader thinks that life jackets are a barrier that protect the target. And if all else fails, the victim is floating. The leader suggests having leader supervision. A camper notes that 
two campers have lifeguard experience and could supervise the activity. The group suggests modifying the leader's suggestion. One camper notes that the buddy system doesn't really work very well and it may be unnecessary with active supervision. They all agreed on what to do and went swimming in the defined area with appropriate supervision. Barrier analysis plays a role in pre-trip planning and in the small decisions and undecisions that can culminate in an accident. Decide to Return is a video of a day's outing where a series of decisions made by Cade and Jack eventually results in them becoming fatigued, capsizing, and hypothermic in the cold water. The primary unwanted source of energy is from the cold water. Given their inexperience, they plan to hug the shore. Hugging the shore, they could get by without navigational aids, such as charts and compass. Self-rescue was an easy swim to shore. By hugging the shore, they were less likely to encounter large boats, and they can probably get by without using warning devices. Even though Kate was dressed for the air temperature, by hugging the shore, she could get out of the cold water reasonably quickly if she capsized. Jack fueled his engine with snack foods. Kate didn't. Wearing their life jackets, the life jackets kept their heads out of the water and offered some cold water protection. Complementing the lack of equipment, they had little paddling knowledge, minimum skills, beginning paddling ability, and two to three weeks of experience. Potential barriers were emitted or those that they did have had gaping holes in them. With the preparations that they had made, along with the decision to hug the shore, do you think their decision to hug the shore was reasonable and would have most likely not caused an incident? Although you never know how things will turn out, they most likely had sufficient barriers even with the omissions and their inexperience to survive the day. The life jacket and a quick exit from the cold water would most likely have minimized the thermal impact of the unwanted energy flow from the cold water. Kate and Jack take a break in the cove. Kate decides she wants to paddle out in the open water toward a distant island. Jack acquiesces. This may seem to be a small change, but in terms of the barrier analysis factors, it is a major change. Review the barrier analysis discussed. In your opinion, was this a good decision? The barriers that had minor impact when they were hugging the shore now have a major impact. Without charts and navigational skills, they underestimated the distance to the island. Without a paddle float, Kate is unable to self-rescue and Jack doesn't know how to assist her rescue when she eventually capsizes. Fog sets in and they are unable to warn. Kate experiences fatigue. She is not keeping hydrated and fueling her engine. When she eventually capsizes, her life jacket keeps her afloat. The life jacket provides some protection, but is less than adequate against the cold water. Without a wetsuit, dry suit, or rescue, Kate becomes hypothermic, and without assistance from a lobster boat passing by, she would eventually succumb to hypothermia. A youth group is doing a multi-day backcountry canoe trip that includes large expanses of open water. They are paddling toward their next campsite. A solo paddler catches up with the group and informs the leader that a major front was moving through the area tomorrow. Expect 30 mile an hour winds and possible microbursts. He notes it could be a rough open water paddle tomorrow. The leader thanks the paddler. Several campers overhear the conversation and express their concern. What if the weather forecast is correct? It could spell disaster. 
During lunch, he grabs a day pack, goes to a private area, and pulls out his satellite phone. He gives base a call and inquires on the potential bad weather report for tomorrow. Base indicates to call back in 20 minutes after they check the weather bureau. 20 minutes later, the storm warning is confirmed. They have a potential problem. He would discuss it with the group this evening. As the group continues the trip, the leader has two thoughts. It was only by chance that they found out about the possible storm tomorrow. No matter how knowledgeable you are, you can't know everything. Unlike Kate and Jack, who relied on multiple barriers, he only had one barrier, the satellite, phone, and base to rely upon. But then, they hadn't taken the steps to weather the storm tomorrow either, which would add more barriers to protect the group. That evening, the leader had a risk management group discussion. He sketched a risk meter on the ground. He suggested that with the coming storm, the potential risks were pretty high. He moved the needle to the right. The group agreed. What could they do to lower the risks? Should they stay or go? The trip tomorrow was a dog leg across the lake, and then the following day it was back across the lake again to a point a mile further up the shore. The current site was well sheltered from the elements. They could stay at this campsite tomorrow and easily make up the extra mile the following day. A discussion ensued. In your opinion, tomorrow should they stay or go? The leader had set up the discussion for the group to stay put. The group agreed. They moved the meter's needle back to the left. If you noted that they should go, you might consider steps to minimize open water paddling and taking other measures to minimize the risks associated with the storm. A camper notes that the sites were reserved and what if another group arrives at their site tomorrow evening. The leader notes that it was a possibility that it was a safety issue for them and that they would have to make do. They moved the needle to increase the risks slightly. Tomorrow they would need to secure the tents, check for potential deadfalls, and move some of their more exposed tents inland. They needed to provide some alternative activities. They concluded that this lowered the risks and moved the needle back to the left. In terms of barrier analysis, he noted that they had in place enough barriers to protect the group and reduce the impact of the pending storm to a manageable level. He added, you can't guarantee safety, but they were acting prudently. Tomorrow would be a layover day. A club trip consisting mostly of kayakers is running a river trip. There are several up and coming paddlers on the trip they come to a major rapids. At this level, the normal route listed on the website is to run river right and avoid the large breaking wave in the center of the drop. One of the up and coming paddlers discusses running the more aggressive river left route with the informal leader of the group. They conclude that his skill level is suitable for the route. What if you come out of your boat, contemplates the informal leader. No problem. Eddie out at the top of the rapids, run last, and we will set up rescue with the other boaters at the bottom of the rapids. As the informal leader of the group, which of the following measures would you take? Given the discussion and the paddler's skill level, either the boat or shore rescue with a throw bag is most likely recommended. It depends on the situation. What is important is that there is communication between members of the group, that they assess the situation, and that they place the appropriate barriers in place, which in this case are the rescue measures if needed. Variations of this scenario are played out countless times on many rivers. Fortunately, the paddler ran the more aggressive route successfully and didn't need assistance. 
Accidents or incidents are the result of an unwanted energy transfer from a source to the target. Risk management and accident prevention is the process of placing barriers that are less than adequate to prevent or reduce the impact of the energy transfer. Play the what-if game or simply ask, what can harm me and my group? Once you identify the sources that can harm you, it is a process of finding ways to prevent the harm. It could be deciding that cooks wear shoes and long pants in the kitchen, deciding to wear life jackets while swimming, deciding to hug the shore, deciding to have a layover day, or deciding to set up rescue at the bottom of a rapids. It is the process of making decisions that protect you and your group from harm.